Welcome everybody to another edition of the Vives Girls newsletter, this time July 2015. As uh, always, four topics. Um, I'm going to get right into it today. And as always, I've got everything right in front of me on my computer to stay in line with what I've written. Um, so the people who read getting the same information like you guys who are watching the video. So first of all, I have to announce that I'll be going on holidays. Um, it's been a year since I went away last time, so I believe I'm allowed to have <laughs> one holiday a year. Um, this time I'm going for about three and a half weeks um, off to Europe again to a music festival, which I'm pretty excited about. I haven't been to a three day festival in years, so it's going to be really, really cool and amazing. Um, followed by some quality time with my family and a wedding in Lithuania, which I haven't been to yet. So, um, yeah, exciting stuff to come. What does that mean for you guys? Um, there will be no available sessions with Vivesco starting Wednesday, the 22nd of July. And my first day back will be Saturday, the 15th of August. So should you need anyone to look after you in the time while I'm away, um, I've got a few recommendations. I've got the links in the actual newsletter. So I'll just go back into the writing and just click on the names. We've got Kate, um, f uh, who is a movement coach in Scarborough. Jesse, who is a movement coach in North Beach. Uh, we've got Complete Body Approach in West Perth. Um, Elements Body Works, uh, again in Scarborough. And we have Tonic Massage in Carrying Up. So Kate and Jess are pretty much movement only. Kate does a little bit of hands-on work, but it's not what she enjoys most. Um, complete body approach, Finbar, um, he does hands-on work as well as movement stuff. And Elements Body Works as well as Tonic Massage are just massage only treatments. So there you go. I hope that will cover you guys till I get back on the 15th of August. Um, second topic today is the fourth of small, uh, 12 small things to do for a healthier living. Today we're going to talk about how to deal with stress. However, I only wrote about how to deal with stress in February this year. So I'll make it short and sweet because we've got a few things to go through at number three with the spiral line today. Anyway, um, so most of us live quite a stressful life nowadays and you always hear like, oh, you got to reduce your stress, you got to reduce your stress, which kind of stresses you out even more because it's really difficult to reduce your stress. So for me, it's more about how to deal with stress rather than trying to reduce it because nowadays, just face it, if you want to reduce your stress, you just got to turn off your mobile, turn off your computer, put yourself on a lonely island and just relax for a few days. Um, so again, the link to my actual write-up about this is in my newsletter. Um, so just go and click on the links if you want to read it all. Otherwise, I'm just going to give you the um, points here that um, I think are can help to how to deal with stress. So first of all is to make some time to meditate. Um, even just if you're in a stressful situation, breathe. If something out of the ordinary happens, take a moment and just breathe breathe and that can often help for you to clear your head and look at the whole situation from a different angle. Um, focus on the good things. So even if something bad is going on or something that you consider bad, just try and think of something nice and happy and positive and get yourself back out of that negativity. Um, notice internal judgment, negative self-talk and distance yourself from it. Um, practice self-compassion kind of goes hand in hand with that so be nice to yourself treat yourself like you would like others to to treat and to be treated and um, yeah just look after yourself um, setting yourself routines so keeping a schedule um, making appointments sticking to those appointments and some people even really have to schedule every minute of their day to make it work for them so you got to figure out what works for you in that case um, keeping a journal can help just to Keep stuff out of your head. Um, create a to-do list. So again, keeping things out of your head, down on paper, tick them off as you do them. Um, and as always, exercise can be an awesome relief, stress, making you feel better, making you feel more relaxed. Um, however, be careful if you're already pretty exhausted and stuff, if you're going for a high intensity session, even though it may make you feel better because you feel like whew, you've got something out of yourself, it may 
have physically too much impact on you and exhaust your adrenals and all that kind of stuff even more so just take care and um, again look after yourself all right let's get into the exciting stuff um myofascial lines today we're talking about the spiral line so so far we covered the superficial back line superficial front line and we did the lateral lines on the side and today we're looking at the spiral line as it says it spirals around our body and keeps the three that we've talked about pretty much in balance but we get into that so um here is the spiral line it's just like the lateral line we talked about last month. It's really two lines, one going down on the right and one going around on the left side. They kind of loop around the body, connecting each side of the skull across the upper back to the opposite shoulder, following around the ribcage to the front to cross over again at around navel level, traveling down towards the hip. From the hip they go down the outside of the thigh, sweeping medial just below the knee to go underneath the foot just in front of the heel, to come up on the other side of the foot to now travel up on the outside of the lower leg, sweeping medial just above the knee on the back side towards the sacrum, where it then follows the track um, of the superficial back line up into the base of the skull. You can see that fairly nicely on the photo shown. So what does the spiral line do posturally? Um, it helps to balance what we're doing posture-wise in all planes of motion. Because it goes in a spiral line, it wraps around everything. It, it, it helps nicely just to keep everything in balance and nicely tucked together. Um, the connection of the pelvic and the, uh, the pelvic angle and the foot helps with proper um, knee tracking in our gait patterns so having the connection here between coming coming here through the hips and through the back of the hips obviously um, and then having both lines kind of tracking along the outside and one coming through the back just helps to keep our knee nicely straight forward when we walk so every time you see someone walking with their knees inwards or outwards while they walk while they move um, that can indicate that there's an issue with that spiral line. That's just something not quite holding on. Um, so the spiral line is heavily connected to, um, as I said, the front line, the back line and the lateral lines. And therefore they can be influenced positively, but also negatively. Um, and it becomes a lot more complex now looking at all those lines together if something is not quite making sense looking at someone posturally um, in saying that most people do have a dominant hand or a dominant leg um, we're never quite the same on each side and the spiral line is widely adaptable and can cope with quite a lot in terms of differentiation between the two sides so you're never going to find anyone who is like 100% balanced left to right. So in terms of compensation, so what can we often see? Um, as you maybe remember from the picture distance, we can see as uh, but with the front and the back line as well, uh, or with the lateral line I should say, we can see either a foot supination, so a slightly like a lift through here, or a pronation, which is your flat foot. We can also see knee rotations, um, either way, going in or out. Um, a pelvic rotation in relation to the feet. So, I can't really see what I'm doing here. But anyway, just imagine this is like your feet on my hands. That would be my knee. This is my pelvic. So you've got your foot flat here. And then the shoulder is rotated. So the feet are still forward but the shoulder comes over here, hip comes forward like that. So we're talking about a hip rotation in relation to the feet. We can also see a rib rotation in regards to the pelvis. So we can see a rib rotation coming through here with the hip staying completely um, straight forward. Um, one shoulder lifted. I've actually got that myself quite a bit. So my shoulder is always kind of a little bit up here and I'm a little bit rotated as well um, and you we often see as well a head shift to one side with that because like for me for example as I've got that lift I've got that lift through the left shoulder here so my right shoulder is actually the one that's rotated 
and dropped forward so that brings that one up so i've got that shift through the rib uh, that rotation through the rib cage here so this is extreme obviously but that kind of then leads to my body going oh this is all a bit weird now so my head needs to go that way <laughs> so i can stay stable um and i think i've got a little bit of a forward thingy going on there as well so i'm always trying to get that back into normal um, looking at movement, the spiral line creates and mediates oblique spirals and rotations. So um, side to side rotation, obviously, um, coming through the body, um, but it also stabilizes through those rotations. So if the spiral line wouldn't go through the legs, for example, and I start rotating here, the spiral line then actually helps my hip and my leg not to go completely like this. What it does, it stabilizes through the slings that that can stay stable and forward and the rotation is just coming through here rather than the whole body just going neck and um, falling into that rotation um all right so let's have a closer look at the track of the spiral line let's start at the head this time at the side of the back of the skull between the occiput and the temporal bones that's number one it runs down to number two, the capitis muscles, and meets the number three, spinous processes from C6 to T5. Here the lines cross over, picking up number four, the rhomboids, on their way, and a smaller part goes underneath the rhomboids, connecting with the serratus posterior superior, connecting with the ribs. Following the rhomboids to, which is number five, the medial border of the scapula, where it connects with the infraspinatus and subscapularis, which are part of the arm lines and again will be discussed more next month. It also connects with number six, the serratus anterior, which explains how the left shoulder is now connected with the right side of the head and the right shoulder connected with the left, left side of the head. So just to show you that connection through um, the rhomboids through the head, the, so the spiral line starts on the back of the head around here and then goes travels down towards the neck, C6, starting to cross over, all the way down here, into your rhomboids, so just in between your shoulders, and then connects into the, into the scapula through here. So that's your left to right connection for the head and the shoulder. The connection between the rhomboids and serratus anterior is very strong, and one could almost say they are one muscular complex. The more common thing we see here are long locked, which means eccentrically loaded rhomboids, and the serrati locked short, so concentric, concentrically loaded, which pulls the scapula away from the spine. So this often shows in the kyphotic spine, which is a round forward shoulder picture. And the opposite is not as common, but one would see the scapula hold closely to the spine, presenting with a rather flat back through the thoracic spine, so not much of a curve going on there either way. So yeah, and what I meant with the kyphotic posture, so what we off the, the picture that we see most often when the when the rhomboid is locked long and the serrati is locked short is that whole kyphotic, so you can see the whole shoulder is coming forward and that's the posture we see here. So that's the most common posture we see. And then you're still going to get massage um, therapists that go into your rhomboids and lengthen them even more, working them away from the spine into into a shoulder. So they're putting them even further away from where they already are, where they should really focus on getting that serratus back and then also working those rhomboids towards the spine in a very gentle way. But that's just on the side. All right, let's keep going. Following the spiral line now, tracking along to number seven, the rib cage going to the front through attaching to ribs number five to nine. The serratus anterior here has a good facial connection to number eight, the external obliques. The fibers of those externals carry on medially, so towards the navel, and down towards number nine, which is the linear alba, so right the midline of the trunk, where they mesh with the fibers number 10 from the other side. Um, compensation patterns here can show up as a shortage between the rib cage and the hip on one side compared to the other, with or without a rotational pattern. On the next station, we have a lot of different muscles um, attaching, pulling into all sorts of direction. Uh, number 11, which is the anterior superior iliac spine, your ASIS, 
we have attached here the internal obliques, transversus abdominis, sartorius, iliacus, rectus femoris, tensor fascia latae, uh, gluteus medius, external obliques, and the external obliques. Um, so first, all of this means that any kind of imbalance can be super complex and needs patience to work out to, to where it comes from. Second of all, in terms of the spiral line, this also means that there is not always a continuity between the, the upper spiral line and the lower spiral line. So imbalances in the upper spiral line um, doesn't mean that they continue necessarily to the lower part or vice versa. So you can split the spiral line into an upper part and a lower part, lower part being hip down to the feet, upper part being hip up to the upper arm um, to the head. The lower spiral line can be seen as a sling that goes from the hip underneath the foot and back to the hip. Coming out of the AIS, ASIS, the spiral line connects with number 12, your tensor um, fascia latte, which then flows into your IT band. Um, here we stay anteriorly this time and pass by the knee, number 13, into number 14, your tibialis anterior, on the front of the lower leg. Tibialis anterior tracks down and inwards, going into the joint capsule between number 15, the first cuneiform and first metatarsal of the foot. From the other side into the same joint capsule comes number 16, your fibularis longus. This is our connection to the other side of the foot and creates a stirrup under the foot, just behind the arch. If you follow fibularis longus upwards, we find ourselves on the anterolateral aspect of the lower leg, so kind of front side of the lower leg, where both tibialis anterior and fibularis longus are right next to each other, divided by... We keep going up now towards number 17, the fibula, and then start sweeping inwards through the hamstrings, in particular the short head of the bicep femoris, number 18, and also adductor magnus into number 19, your ischial tuberosity, also called your sitting bone. It is these two that are often the culprits of the so-called tight hamstrings, preventing proper hip flexion or hip-knee interplay. I often find adductor magnus in particular super tense with most of my clients, right at the sitting bone. There's often the, the bone, like the fascia, is just completely locked into that, into that bony part there. Why that is, I don't know. From the sitting bone, the spiral line now follows the track of the superficial back line onto number 20, your sacrotuberous ligament, across number 21, your sacral fascia, where it crosses over again to the opposite side to then follow along number 22, your rectus spiny, all the way back into the back of the skull, connecting to number 23, your occiput, just medial to where we started, so just a bit further towards the spine. Cool. So if you manage to follow all this along, you may now see how the one side connects with the other and also how they interplay with each other. So with the spiral line, you will often, you will always see that one side is engaged eccentrically loaded while the other one is engaged concentrically loaded. Um, there is another picture here which I'll show you, which um, shows how uh, twisting motions engage the spiral line on both sides, but in a different pattern. So check these out. So looking at the spiral line again, I hope it clarifies again even more why I always work opposite sides. Um, for example, even work the ribs, even if you do come in and complain with neck pain, because it is connected. So with every month um, that we're getting more and more into stuff, you should become clearer and clearer about how the body's connected, how it all works together. And um, why I approach everyone um, every time like a blank canvas, because the body changes all the time and is never the same and always into place in different areas. So um, it's always new and you always have to approach everyone individually on at the given time. Um, yeah, so I hope that all makes a bit more sense. Um, all pictures and the content as well, even though it's um, edited by me, is all property of Anatomy Trains. And we're finishing off with the soup of the month, which this time is a sweet potato and pumpkin soup. For that, you need one sweet potato, about a medium-sized pumpkin, any kind will do, uh, half a big onion, one glove of garlic, about a tablespoon of vegetable stock, or um, just chop that a carrot and a couple of pieces of any root vegetable to chuck that in. 
uh, about a liter to a liter and a half of water, salt and pepper to taste, chop it all up, chuck it in the pot, boil it up and then blend it through and um, enjoy. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, let me know how um, if, if there's any feedback. Um, if you're just sharing my newsletters with friends, make sure they actually subscribe to it as well. Um, so they, they stay up to date and never miss any of this information. And um, other than that, I'll see you guys around for the next three weeks. Then I'm off and I'll see you again in August. Thanks and bye for now.